Good evening, everyone. My name is Paul Schlickman. I'm president pro tem, uh, or chairperson pro tem of the school committee for the purposes of an organizational meeting. We begin with um, policy BEDL, which requires the reading of a land acknowledgement at the beginning of the uh, organizational meeting. We acknowledge that the town of Arlington is located on the ancestral lands of the Massachusetts tribe, the tribe of indigenous peoples from whom the colony, <coughs> province, and commonwealth have taken their names. We pay our respects to the ancestral bloodline of the Massachusetts tribe and their descendants who still inhabit historic Massachusetts territories today. Our business of the day is to elect officers. Uh, the first item of business is to elect a chair for the 2023-24 session. Mr. Thielman. I nominate Dr. Chrissy Allison Ampe to be our chair. Do we have a second? Second. <clears throat> okay, motion by Mr. Thielman, seconded by Mr. Cardin. Under the policy, there are no other nominations as no, no other people have put forth their name. All in favor of Dr. Allison Ampe as being chair of the Arlington School Committee for the 2023-24 school year, say aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, it's a unanimous vote. Nomination election for the Office of Vice Chair for the 2023-24 school year, uh, school committee year, Dr. Allison Ampe. I nominate Mr. Schlickman. Thank you. Second? Second. Second by Ms. Morgan. Nom uh, motion by Dr. Allison Ampe, seconded by Ms. Morgan. As no other names have been submitted po uh, by policy, I call a vote. All in favor? Yes. 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 Aye. Opposed? Uh, that's a unanimous vote. Uh, nomination for the Office of Secretary, Ms. Gittleson. I nominate Elizabeth Exton. Uh, second? Second. Second by Dr. Allison Ampe. Motion by Ms. Gittleson, uh, second by Dr. Allison Ampe, uh, for Liz Exton to be the secretary for the 2023-24 school committee year. All in favor, say aye. Yes. Aye. aye. Opposed? Hearing none, that's a unanim unanimous vote. Congratulations. Um, <clears throat> vote to approve uh, committee and liaison assignments. Uh, a previous version in the book or in, in Novus included the liaisons from the school department, which isn't necessary. So there's a new version with just the names of the school committee members. Uh, I'm looking for a motion to approve. So moved. Motion second. by Mr. Thielman, second by Dr. Allison Ampe. Any debate, debate or discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Yes. Aye. Uh, opposed? That is the unanimous vote. Um, uh, next motion will be to vote on the authorization of the chair and alternate uh, to sign the payroll warrant, which would be the, uh, uh, the warrant committee. Um, I'm looking for a motion. Mo so moved, so by, moved. Mis by Mr. Thielman, second by Dr. Allison Ampe. All in favor? Yes. Aye. Uh, all opposed? Uh, that is the unanimous vote. Before I uh, go to the last item of business, I just want to be able to take this opportunity as being a very temporary chair of this committee to make a remark. I want to thank the voters of Arlington for returning me to the seat on the Arlington School Committee. I want to congratulate Liz Exton, an excellent colleague who did a great job as the previous chair of the school committee. I also want to congratulate Laura Gittleson, who demonstrated that she has a dedicated and thoughtful candidate will be an excellent, excellent addition to our team. I also want to express my appreciation to Jill Krzyzewski. I can't begin to count the number of people who told me they wanted to vote for all four candidates. And we came to know Jill as a very impressive educational leader. I hope she'll find her way to this table sometime in the future. Uh, our next item of business is to, um, is the um, acknowledgement of standards and norms for the Arlington School Committee, which is done by policy BDA-E, um, which we will vote on and then have everybody sign to acknowledge. 
A uh, motion by Mr. Thielman, second by Dr. Allison Ampey to uh, acknowledge the norms and standards. All in favor? Yes. Yes. Aye. Opposed? That's the unanimous vote. Um, the se administrative secretary to the school committee will pass around a copy of the policy for everyone to sign. Having concluded the business of the organizational meeting, I'm looking for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Motion by Mr. Thielman. Second. Second by Dr. Allison Ampey. All in favor? Yes. yes. Aye. Opposed? Congratulations. It's yours now. The, this meeting is adjourned. Welcome to this regular meeting of the Arlington School Committee on Thursday, April 13th, 2023. Um, we are back in our school committee room. Before we begin, I wanna make a few comments. First, thank you to my colleagues for their support in electing me chair. Because we have a new member today, welcome, Ms. Gibbleson. Thank you. It has made me look back 13 years, though, when Judson Pierce and I were first elected. Ms. Gibbleson is joining a committee that is so different from the one that Mr. Pierce and I joined. In 2010, the total years of experience on the entire committee was 15 years, with most of this held in one person, Mr. Thielman. <laughs> Five members had two or less years of experience each. Ms. Gibbleson, unlike myself, is joining a committee with a combined total of 65 years of experience. Members have stood for re-election again and again and the community has affirmed their ability to do the job that school committee has charged to do. While Mr. Philman does still hold the most experience, he is no longer an outlier. One of the benefits of this amount of experience is that members have become more knowledgeable about how a school committee does its work. <coughs> One of the main ways the school committee gets things done is through policy. We have a policy manual, which used to be a big six inch thick book and now lives in an electronically searchable database. Our policies create the rules which we must follow. They also create the guidelines for our staff, our students, and our community. Sometimes our policies are in conflict with each other or they are unclear. When this happens, we do the best we can and also take steps to remedy the issue. The hearing that was to be held today under policy IJR reconsideration of materials was scheduled because a challenge issued about part of the health, health and human development curriculum. It was part of the process required, required by IJR that was developed by the superintendent with input from school committee members. The hearing itself underwent multiple changes of venue and process in an attempt to provide the most appropriate and safe event for the many people who wished to express their views. Then the complaint was withdrawn. The hearing was therefore canceled because there was no longer a defining reason for its existence. I am very aware and saddened that some of Arlington's LGBTQIA plus students, staff, and even community members who are not parents nor students themselves felt threatened by this process. I am also aware that members of the greater greater community are confused as to why the hearing was not held and have questions about what will happen moving forward. What I don't know yet is exactly how we will go forward because we as a school committee have not yet had a chance to discuss this together. But this is a priority for us. Another thing that many years of experience on the school committee brings is a clear understanding that none of us can act alone. <laughs> We have power and influence only as a group. Open meeting laws mean that we cannot do the messy work behind the screen, behind the scenes, presenting to the public only the polished product, but rather that we must do our sausage making in full view. And it can be very, very messy. And I have faith that we as a group will figure out our path forward, a path that affirms the vision of the Arlington Public Schools to be an equitable educational community where all learners feel a sense of belonging, experience growth and joy, and are empowered to shape their own futures and contribute to a better world. Thank you. We now move to public comment. Before I begin, I would like to review sections of our policy BEDH, which governs public comment. 
During the public comment se segment of regular meetings of the committee, individuals or group representatives may address the committee on items of school business. The length of public participation will normally be no more than 20 minutes, but may be extended by the chair. Speakers must identify themselves by name and address and will be allowed up to three minutes to present their material. This chairperson may reduce speaking time if needed and or may permit extension of this time limit. Inappropriate or improper conduct and remarks, including use of obscenity or abusive language, will not be tolerated. Defamatory or abusive re remarks are always out of order. If a speaker persists in improper conduct or remarks, the chairperson, me, may terminate that individual's privilege of address. All remarks will be addressed through the chairperson of the meeting. Speakers may offer such objective <coughs> criticisms of the school operations and programs as concern them, but in public session, the com committee will not hear personal complaints about school personnel, nor about any member of the school community, except for the school committee or the superintendent in their capacity as the operational leader of the Arlington Public Schools. Under most circumstances, administration, administrative channels are the proper means of disposition of legitimate complaints involving staff members. The public is reminded that the school committee does not hold jurisdiction over the performance of school personnel other than the superintendent. So we have three people sign up for comment today. Um, Mr. Kaplan, you need to come up to the mic, please. Hi, I'm Mark Kepline, 11 Palmer Street, Arlington, town meeting member for Precinct 9. So I first learned of this proposed change to the uh, health curriculum for fourth and fifth graders uh, just the other day, and I was quite disturbed by it. Um, not that kids shouldn't get that kind of education, but that you're taking an anti-science stand um, opposing uh, established fact that there are two genders and two sexes for humans and pretending that there are more. Um, with, with the exception of rare uh, genetic and gestational abnormalities, there really, there's just two genders. Um, so, and, and the thing is that this has grown into a huge internet fad of, you know, enormous proportions with the multiple gender thing and all kinds of individual ideologies and identities. Um, and uh, it's worse than Tide Pods. Um, and it's dangerous to kids. So if somebody has some sort of dysphoria, um, you know, asking everybody to pretend that that's normal and fine is doing a disservice to these people who are experiencing it. Um, they should have some sort of sanity and reality check and, and guidance in this and, and, and not have everybody go along with it. But it's a normal thing for kids to want to develop an identity and their, identify their tribe and this has always been the case. Maybe in the 60s, some kids grew long hair. But, you know, when they went through that and it was over, they can just cut their hair and go on with life. Um, later on, we had the whole goth thing, and that was, that was okay. When you run out of mascara, hang up your Doc Martens and resume a normal life. Um, you don't have to uh, fight and, and against society as much anymore. Um, so it's a need for kids to go through this. But in this case, for getting hormone therapy and surgery, these are long-lasting uh, long consequences for kids. I, I need you to stick to things that relate to the schools, please. Oh, well, this is the curriculum. And, and I need you to stick to things that relate to the schools, please. I, are you going to adopt this curriculum? I need you to relate things that re relate to the curriculum, please, to the schools. Yeah, so. Uh, okay, I think you're um, 
Mr. Kaplan, your time is finished. Thank you. Mm. All right. Thank you. Please, please embrace science. Um, Mr. Corcoran uh, is remote. There. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Now, can you see me? All right, excellent. Uh, good evening. My name is Brian Corcoran. Um, my son is a third grader at Hardy. My daughter is a first grader at Hardy. We all live at 47 Everett Street. Um, what a terrible look for our community the last couple of weeks have been. My wife and I moved to Arlington nine and a half years ago with eyes wide open. The process that concluded yesterday with a brief email began in January with an email to fourth and fifth grade parents. Since receiving that email from a friend, there has been only one thing that has genuinely surprised me. That in 2001, the fifth grade curriculum in APS was approximately the same curriculum that I received as a fifth grader in the mid 80s. So in two years, the APS curriculum has changed from something similar to 1985 Cowtown uh, in Connecticut um, to the gender unicorn, okay? With fourth graders added into the mix, okay? And that is by any measure a substantive change to the curriculum. APS's own policy required school committee approval in this case, and that clearly did not happen. Substantive changes also trigger notification requirements to parents. Okay. It could be argued that those notification requirements were met by the letter of the policy, but you couldn't argue that the spirit of that policy uh, has been achieved since January. My personal overarching objection to APS curriculum and culture is the obsession with identity. We have what appears to be an increasing youth mental health crisis, and we continue to encourage APS students to look ever further inward. And then we tell them that if others do not see them in precisely the same way that, these, that they see themselves, that harm has been done. I will never understand why adults would encourage children to adopt this approach that tramples all over one's agency. And I'll continue to believe that this obsession with identity is strongly correlated with the state of youth mental health. The Rainbow Commission's Facebook page reads, Government Agency. I hope that elected and administrative town officials will join me in criticizing the approach to advocacy that the commission took in the last two weeks. The commission's published testimony is emotionally dysregulated. If the state of the student population described in their testimony is accurate, the town would do well to find stable mentors for them. This has been a failure of leadership, and it's unfortunate that it occurred for such an important issue. Mr. Corcoran, and for an issue that's that three I... minutes. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. OK. And our last speaker. Um, Ms. Orfanos? Yep. How are you? Okay. First, I would like to acknowledge that this is a highly controversial topic. That being said, this school committee is indeed obligated to hear all sides. Unfortunately, intimidation and fear is being used to silence debate. Name and address for the record. And when you said that... Can, the, you give name and address for the record. I'm sorry, I forgot to my ask. My name is Michelle Orfanos. I don't want to give my address for fear of uh, retaliation, we, which is happening. So, you're a resident of the town? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So as I was saying, unfortunately, intimidation and fear is being used to silence debate. Open debate should not be threatening. It should, it's a conversation. We should be able to have this conversation about the children, which are our most precious asset. I'm curious if this committee weighs in that these very tactics were involved with the removal of the challenge. 
I'm curious if any one of the school committee members have reached out to that parent. I'm also curious why the change in the teaching from the great body shop, which included factual biology to explain puberty changes of boys and girls, they switched to a presentation where the terms boy and girl are not to be spoken. The terms boy and girl are not to be spoken during human growth and development, discussing puberty. Instead, boy and girl is to be replaced with person with vulva, person with vagina, person with penis. How is this appropriate for fourth graders? If we are to rely on a cartoon unicorn to explain these gender identity terms, perhaps, indeed, it's inappropriate and the children are too young. My understanding is at the Stratton School, the kids were read a transgendered book in kindergarten, where one of the little characters identified as cisgendered or some other gender. This is kindergarten. My understanding that there is 350 cities and towns that had the opportunity to adopt this curriculum. My question is why did Arlington decide to be one of only 10 to go forward with this? I really hope that the school committee listens to all sides of this. I really, really encourage you to have an open debate and discussion before you make these decisions that clearly citizens, parents, are maybe opposed to. I know I am. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. This ends public comment. And, oops, where's my agenda? <coughs> the next item is our uh, AHS student representatives, uh, Mo and Amy. Uh, yeah, oh. I'm sorry. Oh. Oh, yeah. All right. Uh, so today actually was our second round of our inclusion and diversity workshops, which uh, went great, at least the one I, I was leading one, and it was really a good group of people, and we had some nice conversations. Um, this past weekend, there was the AHS Battle of the Bands. It was the first time we did it in our own auditorium. It was, it was great, really fun. Um, uh, AP exams are coming up, and we are organizing like a, a group like study session, uh, providing resources for people to help study. Um, the Red Cross Club is also doing a dodgeball tournament. Um, and we were doing a food drive this week for Arlington Eats, and sports in general are doing good, and everyone's having a good time. Everyone's excited for break, a much needed break. Can I ask one question? How many AP exams are the two of you taking? Uh, I'm taking three. I'm taking two. Good luck. Mm -hmm. Ace it. Okay. And I also want to acknowledge our AEA representative, Ms. Fernandez. Thank you. Do you mind raising your voice? I'm, I can't hear you. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying. Sorry. Give him a mic. I have the mic. Here. Yeah. Can someone tell, ask Sean, because there's things that can be done with the miking in here. Do you know what it is? The air conditioning. Air conditioning. Uh, yeah. We but still, there's, thing, on the, there's things they can do. For, yeah. yeah. We turned it off. Okay. We do have a speaker in the room. Yeah. Okay. There's no amplified audio on this microphone. In the room. Mm -hmm. There used to be. Because it's yeah, because it's the Zoom. Oh, the Zoom. Okay. Um, next is the ELL uh, with Ms. Brzezuzzi. So I'm going to drive for you. Okay. And you can tell me when to advance. Yep. Okay. Yes, um, so 
Thank you, Ms. Brzezzi, for being here and for presenting, um, along with Ms. Dingman. Appreciate your presence. Um, we did sort of ask them to come and join us and give this presentation. Not sure if they were going to, and then now they're going to, and so we're very grateful for you very quickly coming together to give us an update on uh, English learner education, which has been undergoing a lot of updates and expansions uh, recently because we have a lot of wonderful new students with us. And so I'm glad that you could be here to present some updates on all that you've been up to recently. And I'll hand it off to you. Let me know when you want me to advance the slide. Okay. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, Dr. Homan, thank you. Dr. McNeil. Mr. Spiegel, Ms. Elmer, and Honorable School Committee Chair members, thank you for allowing me to come and provide some um, great things that are happening in the ELL department currently. And I have my colleague, I'm Carla Brzezzi, the director of ELL, and I have my colleague, Mrs. Dingman, who's our ELL teacher at the Hardy School. So if there are any questions after the presentation on anything with curriculum, we have an expert here, as well as she's gonna share something exciting that she has begun in the Arlington schools. So we're really fortunate in Arlington Public Schools because we have a truly culturally and, lingu and linguistically diverse group of students. Um, our languages are from 35 to 45, 40, 35 to 40 different cultures and languages represented in Arlington. It's a desirable community for a lot of families to come in and we have had growth within the years. So the agenda for this evening, I'm trying to keep it Sh not short, but as short, you know, to give to give as much as information as I can within a, a certain time minute, is I'd like to provide a, a brief overview of the EL program, talk a little bit about our successes that we've had this past school year in years past, where are, where are our growth opportunities that we're still working on, some of our priorities that we're going forward in the next school year, and then I will leave it up to discussion if any of you have any questions at all for us. So everything that we do in our ELL department um, always follows the strategic initiative and the plan of the Arlington Public Schools. So we are following along with our planning, teaching, everything we do with the vision and mission statement that we have, providing equitable educational community um, for all learners. We want all our students to feel a sense of belonging, uh, experience growth and joy as well as putting the whole child at the center. Going on um, our ELL vision and mission, I'm not gonna read the whole slide, you have that, but it, it, it complements the Arlington Public Schools vision and mission where um, we want to accomplish language and content development through a culturally and linguistically safe, equitable learning environment. In, um, in the town, in the schools, in our department, it is our belief that speaking more than one language is a valuable asset and is a resource that our ELs students bring to our classrooms. We also talk about our, I'm not gonna read the whole guiding principles, um, but we wanna make, sure we always provide our program builds on the students' backgrounds and what students bring to our classroom. So simultaneously, while they are learning English proficiency and content, we also wanna make sure that they have self-confidence in their learning. Um, in addition to their academic development, EL learners need support from all educational staff in Arlington, adapting to US cultural, linguistical, and school social norms. So who are our ELL learners? We have this diverse population, which is tremendous in our schools. Um, some interesting data that I wanted to share with all of you is that our enrollment is growing and we have about uh, currently 295 ELs um, district-wide. This is just two days ago with the data. And we are considered a mid-incident school district in Massachusetts. Um, we, our ELL is 5% uh, of the total enrollment, and that's including the 295 active ELs, and then our formerly, our FELs, our former English learners, we have about 175. We actually monitor our, fo our formerly English learners, our FELs, for four years. EL instruction is offered at all of our 10 schools. I'm currently working with the preschool coordinator to see how we can get at least um, a part-time position in the preschool. I think there is some point two somewhere where we're trying to figure that out. It's trying to find somebody to actually wanna teach that for, for point two. Um, our main language backgrounds that we um, 
have most of our learners speaking are Chinese, Haitian Creole, Japanese, Portuguese, and Spanish. We have more United States born English learners um, than students that are born outside of the United States. That was, it's interesting. And then I did mention that um, our former English learners are monitored four years. So even though they're not, they're not um, having direct support services in the schools, we, they are still English language learners and need supports and we monitor them. And um, due to the growth in enrollment, um, we have been able to have a, a great team currently and we're up to 18 professional um, staff members working in our EL program. So this is kind of hard to read, but I wanted to, um, everything that we do in our schools is about children. And I wanted to provide a snippet of a writing sample from one of our English language learners. It's not a current student, <laughs> it's a past student. But I want to read what they wrote uh, about learning English. How do I learn English? I learn English reading books in English. In the library, I read two books, English. I rent one book and I read. When I go to the library, I put the book on his place. I rent one book, I read all the books of the library. When I read one book, I now I now know English, and I talk more English, and the school and the teachers say, Jazelle, you learn me English. So because we do everything about our learners, I wanted to make sure that there was a sample of writing, of amazing writing from one of our English language learners, actually a newcomer in past years. So what we do in our EL department, we, have, we situate and everything is targeted toward the WIDA English Language Devel Development Standards. These have been revised in 2020. Um, the framework in the addition, the big ideas of the WIDA ELD framework are, um, you can do the next slide, sorry. sorry. Yep. The big ideas in this framework that, we're, that is provided to us from the state in, in DESE is equity or opportunity of access collaboration among all the stakeholders um, with our ELs, integration of the content and language, and then the functional approach to language development. So that is our model that we work within our elementary, middle, and high schools. And when we look further into what um, the key understandings are for our EL curriculum and instruction, the, I just gave three bullet points. Vocabulary is, in, is integral to language development. There's an essential role of oral language development in the development of academic English. And then a lot of our language and content learning activities are within the four domains of reading, writing, speaking, and listening. We use the, through the key uses of academic language that WIDA has designed are um, narrate, argue, inform, and explain. So all our planning surrounds the WIDA ELD as well as the state standards and the core content. This visual, this visual is just showing you um, that our ELD, our EL curriculum aligns with the standards of WIDA along with the core content strands. So the big, the big thing that I'd like to share with all of you is last year um, we were in an ELL tier focus monitoring year. Last spring, uh, 2021, right? Yeah. No, 2020-22, sorry, <laughs> losing. Um, we had to complete an Arlington Public School self-assessment of all the criteria that DESE would come in to evaluate. In the fall, the Office of Language Acquisition came into Arlington and we had to provide records, student records, as well as um, educator interviews. We were evaluated on 12 criteria. Um, and then in the winter, we had a final report and then right now I'm working on the uh, tiered focus monitoring continuous improvement monitoring plan, the SIMP. And so we did really great and I'm really proud of Arlington. There are just two um, criteria that we were partially implemented. We didn't have full implementation. So we're a little bit out of compliance. Um, and I put them on a slide. Area one was the parent involvement, um, the ELE seven. It is, we provided all the documentation that is asked for districts about getting parent involvement. Um, all the outreach we have done, we've uploaded, we gave them everything they asked, but they still cited us because we don't have an LPAC. We don't have an English Learner Parent Advisory Council like we have with the CPAC parents. It's not that we haven't tried to get this. It has been really challenging. A lot of parents are interested, but then nobody commits to wanting to be an officer and having bylaws. But we did recently just have a, um, 
school open house at Gibbs and it looks optimistic there are three families want to follow up with me and to, to begin this work so hopefully we'll get out of the non-compliance and then the other area of um, a non-compliance or partial implementation was the licensure requirements the state identified I think it was seven educators so we had a 96 percent rate which was I thought was phenomenal that everybody is SEI endorsed but the state still cited us because there were like seven um, educators that did not have endorsement as well as two administrators. Some of that I worked with the HR department was that the teachers didn't actually go into the ELAR and apply for the endorsement. And then some of that is that um, there's a plan for these teachers to get their endorsement through SEIM TEL, taking a test, or taking a course. So we're on that, it's just that that is gonna take a little bit longer for licensure. So I'm gonna actually um, just put this over here because Hannah will be talking in a minute. But um, one of our, a lot of our great successes through the leadership of Dr. Homan and Dr. McNeil and all my colleagues and the administrative team, when we had budget season, we had partnerships of what, what we needed for student support. So we were able to hire um, new team members at Bishop, um, this past year, uh, a teacher started in September. At Pierce, the teacher literally just started a couple of weeks ago. Um, at Arlington High School, it was like back in the spring, winter of 2022. And at Audison Middle School, we had a teacher again added um, to the team just like a month or so ago. So that's a huge success that our department is growing. Um, a really uh, big success I'm really proud about, um, as well as the Afghan refugee grant support to schools. I worked with Julie Dunn through DESE, uh, writing a grant for our Af Af Afghani students that are um, mostly at Thompson. I think we have about eight or nine at Thompson. So we're able to provide after school tutoring, reading and math, some PD for teachers, and a lot of instructional materials for the gen ed classroom. And then a huge success that has been, I'm really excited about, is this Family Welcome Center. Finally, it's taking about 10 years to finally get this off the ground and having a new uh, colleague uh, being the Director of Communications and working with family engagement. And then uh, through uh, Dr. Homan and Dr. McNeil's leadership, we were able to provide district-wide PD three courses for educators to get your SEI PDPs this past year. And then I'm going to leave it to Hannah to just discuss a teeny bit about this engaging bridge project. Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, the bridge project is a, co a collaboration that started, we're in pilot year number one at Hardy School. So this is working with a high school student, currently a 10th grade student, who used to go to Hardy and she wanted to give back by providing tutoring services um, through the high school. She can receive graduate credit for that. Not graduate credit, that's what I do. She can get credit towards um, community service. Um, so she loved it. She did two rounds of it two years in a row. And then her idea this year was to expand and find other bilingual friends. Um, my part was to help connect families who are current EL students at Hardy School and help her match them with tutors at the high school level who are bilingual. So that's been a great success. It's pilot year one. It's been going well, and my hope is to extend out to all the other schools next year. Thank you, Hannah. And then um, I don't want to call them challenges. I want to say, call them growth opportunities that we have going on for EL and in, in going forward. The biggest challenge, and, and well, not a challenge, the growth is we want to get this LPAC to bridge and collaborate with our parents and families, um, and obviously for <clears throat> compliance purposes. Another big area of growth is tier one instruction. So we need to continue the partnerships with general education and EL so um, we can utilize those SEI strategies. We've seen then when um, an EL teacher and a gen ed teacher are able to co-plan together, the growth in, with newcomers and SLIFE students, students with interrupted education is, is immense growth. Um, a, a major growth opportunity, and I think this is across the district, is elementary scheduling is always a challenge. Uh, particularly when, um, when a child or a student elementary is pulled in so many different directions, we don't want to fragment their schedule. So that's a challenge. Um, professional development, SEI, and WIDA, I'm, I'm looking forward to see if we can, as a district, 
uh, provide more WIDA opportunities where teachers plan with language objectives and content objectives, being more strategic about our academic language use within our lessons. And then I know that this is also a conversation at the district level about structured time together. Yes, we have our common planning time and our PLC times, but we're trying to see if there's more to create more opportunities of K through 12 team alignment. At times, the EL team is pulled in different directions because of these important district initiatives, but we don't always have a time to meet together as a team to align all of our work. And then moving forward, some sample uh, priorities are obviously compliance is at top of the list. LPAC is number one in SEI endorsement of educators. The Family Welcome Center, I look forward to partnering with whoever that person is and creating this welcoming environment for our families that it's much needed. And then um, through the amazing district initiatives and the leadership of Dr. Homan and Dr. McNeil, um, I'm excited about this deeper learning um, initiative that's going on and I, I was thinking okay so what do we do in ELL with this so my question is like next year with my team what does deeper learning look like in ELL in student support classes and how can we document that to show everybody so we all learn from each other and then uh, a big one is the new ELA curriculum I don't know what's going to be chosen but I'm excited that a lot of those um, finalists have EL specific strategies in, embedded in their curriculum that are target speaking and comprehension. And then um, I leave it up if there anybody has any questions and I believe Dr. Homan that was 12 minutes. Well done. <laughs> Do you want to say anything? Or at the very end. Okay. Yeah, take, how about oh, it? I'll go with questions? you. Mr. Cliffman. Okay. Um, I hold the SEI endorsement. Nice. Excellent. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and, and I worked in a district where, uh, where English learners were sort of our bread and butter. Um, so I probably have a little deeper level of inquiry that, that, that folks would normally come at at a school committee meeting uh, because this is sort of what I've done in my career and I don't so understand that I won't expect to put you on the spot tonight but sort of if you don't have the answer off the top of your head I'm more than happy to get a follow-up um, first question I think is pretty easy are you finding it challenging to hire uh, teachers with EL licensure for EL positions um, we've been fortunate that our hiring process has been like earlier than other districts mm -hmm. so we've been getting um, excellent candidates mm -hmm. as well as we're getting duly licensed uh, educators that have been in the tier one you know gen ed classroom that want to make the jump to, to EL and we actually have some internal candidates we don't have any open positions currently mm -hmm. but we have some internal candidates that are looking to make the jump from gen ed into EL I like that answer um, the, the thing that districts hang up at traditionally in terms of advancement through the five levels is getting from three to four. Do we have a distribution? Uh, I'd like to see at some point a distribution of how many students are at each level and more, most, most specifically how long it takes for students to make a transition up a level because the thing that is it's really difficult to go from three to four. I don't have that right now, but I do have that data, and I will share it with Dr. Homan to get it out to you. Because we, um, Dr. McNeil has asked me about breakdowns of proficiency levels when we had hiring, so I do have that information. And and I'm also curious as to you, you've recited the five languages. Um, mm -hmm. My sense in looking at the district is that the distribution is different both in terms of elementary schools and both by level so that my impression of the district is we have a far greater number of Japanese speakers in the elementary level and other languages moving up towards high school is that the case that is the correct correct I, I think I skipped the, the data bu bullet but we at, at the elementary is our largest numbers of little learners and we have around 235 little learners mm -hmm. and Japanese is the uh, most prominent language in that group mm -hmm. and as you go to secondary level there are different languages come into play Chinese is a big one in the secondary mm -hmm. but Japanese is huge and the 
children born in the United States who are coming into our EL program, I guess many of those are coming from, say, Puerto Rico, or what, um, what's the story there, there is a large um, students with that speak Spanish backgrounds, mm -hmm. but we actually had, it was like, it was odd to me because I speak fluent Italian. We had an Italian little learner, so they grew up bilingual and then they're ELL, they get mm -hmm. designated as ELL, but most of those ones are Spanish speakers. So they have, so they're speaking another language at home. They do have English skills, but they, they're not up to academic levels. Correct. So they're, they're not true, like, bilingual going in and out of bilingual. They're true needing support. Mm -hmm. And what we're finding with those little learners, and that's, tr that's the trajectory that you were asking for, um, is that they um, exit out a little quicker. Mm -hmm. Uh, from what I understand, this we have an excellent program in this district, and uh, every time you've come before us, I've been impressed with the commitment of your, you and your staff in terms of providing an excellent educa education for second language learners, and that I know that there are many families who choose Arlington because of the reputation of the district in terms of welcoming and instructing them. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Um, we, we, it, it's not me, it's my team. I have mm -hmm. an amazing team of educators that make my job clearly very easy. Mm -hmm. Don't want to say that because I don't want to lose my job, but <laughs> um, they're amazing. And what I can share about ELL in Arlington is that the teacher at the building, they do everything, mm -hmm. the assessments, the mm -hmm. compliance, all of it. Yeah, I've been a principal in an elementary school with, with a boatload of, English learners, and I've seen how, when it's done well, uh, it, it works wonders. It's, it's a beautiful thing. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Thielman? Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. It's a great presentation. It's also good to kind of reflect on how much this uh, group of uh, this, this population that comes to our town enriches and makes the town a better place. Mm -hmm. So thank you for uh, your work and leadership. I just have a few questions. Um, could you just explain? <clears throat> um, Couple things I'm curious about: How long students stay in the ELL program, and how many students would you say that start with us as ELL students and stay for you know from elementary school all, all the way through? Well, that's a complex question. I know be it is be know only it is. because um, it's individual variation. So yeah. you might have children or students, and Hannah, you can jump in as well. We might, you might have students that have a strong literacy background in yeah. their um, L1 that will transition out completely, like one or two, three years, maybe max. But then you might have some learners that um, have interrupted education and come from um, maybe some don't have high literacy in their family, so they might take longer, um, sometimes five, six years. Do we have long-term ELLs within the Arlington Public Schools? We do, that have started at an elementary point that are still receiving services in middle and high school, that is a concern. We don't have a large number in Arlington, but we do have some of those learners. Yeah, yeah, and I, I, I recognize that each case is, is different. There's no real, yeah, I get that. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I, uh, I don't have Mr. Schlickman's experience with, I, I, run, I work for an organization that interfaces with uh, a lot of uh, uh, ELL programs in, the, in um, New Hampshire and Massachusetts and Manchester and Lowell and Bedford, Bedford and other cities. And, you know, one of the things I have observed is that when there is an active um, adult education program in a district, it's actually a way to capture adults mm -hmm. for um, <clears throat> the, 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 uh, the, the adult CPAC, the uh, ELL CPAC, whatever it's supposed to be. Called. The LPAC. LPAC, that's yeah. the word. Yeah, thank you. So um, I don't know, to the extent, that, that's what I've observed, that these districts that have adult, uh, have, have basic education for adults, ESOL classes mm -hmm. for adults, they're the ones that have some success creating LPACs. So I will share with you, thank you for that. Um, Heather Smith that couldn't attend this evening. She's kind of plays a family liaison. She's act actually the teacher at Gibbs School, ES ELL yeah. teacher. She just compiled a survey of our families. I can share that with Dr. Homan to share with all of you. And the survey was exactly that, that they would love to have some adult education classes for English learners. Um, so we can be strategic in looking at our Title III budget and how we can do that. We don't receive a lot of funding, and most of the Title III budget funding goes to our SEI newcomer program at the Bishop School in the summer. But that was one, and then I will share that 
our, our families, which, this is why I'm excited about the Family Welcome Center and the new person that's going to be the feeling agent. They also mentioned to us that they feel isolated when they're right. coming into the town of Arlington. So that is something that where we really want to do more outreach on. Um, we have great translations. In past years, we didn't have anything translated. So uh, with Dr. Homan and Dr. McNeil and the revising, revamping, and me making sure we're reaching out to everybody, I'm seeing that um, better in Arlington. Yeah, I will tell you that in years of working with immigrant populations, the, the place where people find the most camaraderie is in a class setting. So if, you, if there's any way for us to create any adult education class, it doesn't always have to be English, so that's the preferred one. That's the best way to bring community together. And then out of that, you can you know, comply with the state. I will agree, and then I just want to mention quickly, I don't want to infringe upon your time, but um, we're also making partnerships with Teresa Marzilli at the Town of Arlington for the Language Access Program. Um, I believe April 30th, there's going to be something in the town with outreach for families. We will be there as well, Heather Smith, making sure that the language access for everyone in the town um, is critical for our families, as well as making those partnerships with the Town of Arlington and our schools. Good. I'll just add one thing that our teachers share this in our newsletters. Um, there are um, free English classes that go on in the libraries um, as well as through Arlington Continuing Education. Yeah. Um, so we share that whenever it changes. So it's like a seasonal shift. So parents are aware if they are reading our newsletters. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, my my experience with EL was I, the one I was thinking of. I have one of Ms. Dingman's students on my soccer team, um, and we started in uh, September with basically no English and a lot of hand gestures. And 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 last night we had practice, and um, a question was asked, and he raised his hand and just like the whole thing, and we all just were just like our mouths hang open. So um, the work that you're doing is um, magical and amazing and it has implications for um, our students far beyond the walls of our schools. So thank you so much. It's really I important. I, I bet you do. I got him to level four this year. <laughs> wow, that's... Thank you. Mr. Also, Carton. great coaching has got him to improve his English too. Let's no, come no, on. no, 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 no. Thank you, Mr. Curtin. Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you for the presentation. It would be helpful, um, in addition to the data that uh, Mr. Sutton asked for, to see the number of EL students that we've had uh, over the last like five years or so. Uh, Dr. Holman mentioned that we've seen an increase recently, but it would be nice to have a picture of, of that. I will do that. Okay. I will get that to you. Dr. McNeil is my data person, and <laughs> he's always pushing data on all us, so I will get that trajectory great. of the five years. That would be great. And. Um, uh, you know, EL students are part of one of the focal groups in strategic plan, mm -hmm. so you're going to be on the hot seat for the next five years mm -hmm. um, in improving, uh, you know, the, the targets there. Looking at the state data, it looks like we, we have wonderful SGP for MCAS, mm -hmm. um, grades three to eight mm -hmm. for EL students, but for ELA, we're only slightly above the state average, so maybe, I don't know if that's something that you've been focusing on or you think you might need to focus on. That in grades three, three to three eight? eight, yeah. That is on a list of, of things and challenges yeah. to do on, yeah. Great. It okay. depends on like the, the older levels. Mm -hmm. um, we made smaller increments. The younger ones, we made bigger strides. Can I? But SGPA and SGP is what I work with Dr. McNeil and Dr. Holman on. <laughs> yeah, I just want to comment that the um, EL, members of the uh, EL team ha were instrumental in helping us really think about and understand why we needed to move towards re-examination of our elementary literacy core curriculum. Um, so I've spoken with num numerous members of this team about the ways in which these curricula are designed for language acquisition um, in a way that the one we currently have absolutely is not. So I just want to thank you all for the advocacy you've done, and we're hopeful that that will have a big Great. impact on those outcomes. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, is there more questions? Oh, yeah, of course. I'm not ready not to talk. I could talk about ELL all night. I can actually jump in a little bit on that. But I was just going to um, say that I am really pleased to hear that there um, you have highlighted the fact that the new ELA curriculum and the work that you will do to collaborate uh, on that, because I agree that I think that that will have a big impact um, on students. And the other thing I just wanted to highlight um, is your mentioning about the need to collaborate. Um, with other, with 
with with teachers and other disciplines mm -hmm. and other content areas mm -hmm. because that's that's also going to have a big impact um, as Mr. Cardin mentioned on our on that on our focal group um, and achieving our goals on the strategic plan. It is a major impact as well as I will share another piece of data with the team with everyone um, about having two professional teachers in a building mm -hmm. the impact to our access scores and the issue of inequity at schools that only had one EL teacher. So we've mm -hmm. made great growth in Arlington with adding, you know, uh, kudos to Dr. Holman and Dr. McNeil and the budget and getting in um, the needs of, of schools and students looking at the high needs at the schools. Because one teacher at one building teaching K through five, it, it's our K, our K little ones didn't get as much instruction. Mm -hmm. And I'll just add that having two people in a building who can collaborate with one another and share mm -hmm. the same discipline is also going to have mm -hmm. a big impact. We're getting there. So <laughs> we, we still have areas of growth, but I'm really proud of the team. The team is amazing, and um, we love what we do, and the advocacy is amazing. Um, I think that's why I'm here. This is my 11th year in Arlington Public Schools. Just a very brief comment, if I may, Madam Chair. I, I'm really intrigued by Mr. Thielman's suggestion. Uh, when I was running the preschool in Lowell, we had a dedicated uh, class for the parents in that preschool. So that if you had an EL child in the preschool, a parent was in the class so that there was just this wonderful support structure. And if, if we have the population to do it, I think that was grant funded, but we should definitely think about doing something where we're bringing them all together. Very good. Mm -hmm. So get it done and let us know. <laughs> <laughs> if, if I can be of any help, please reach out to me or anyone in our team. We'd be more than happy to, you know, discuss anything further. But mm -hmm. thank you very much. Appreciate thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Hannah. Yeah, Hannah came along. Thank, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Next on our agenda is policy IJR reconsideration of instructional resources. Um, I brought that up so that we can discuss it. Mr. Chokeman. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I play an augmented reality game called Ingress, sort of an adult version of Pokemon Go. I mention this only because a message came across the game chat informing everyone who lives in Arlington to attend a hearing on this curriculum challenge. When we last reviewed our policy manual, we made some changes to align our policies with the prevailing laws and regulations. In the process, file IJ-R was retained in our policy book with the language, quote, when a problem concerning instructional material in a school arises, the disposition of the problem will be made in a reasonable period of time using district adopted procedures. File IJ refers us back to file KEC public complaints about the curriculum or instructional materials. However, the committee no longer has this policy in the manual. The closest policy and the one most commonly referenced in other districts is file KE public complaints. This policy directs complaints to the school administration for study and possible solution. Without proper reference in the policy manual, we find ourselves looking at past practice in which the policy under file KEC was used to challenge an element of our kindergarten curriculum. Given the climate created by this complaint, I believe we need to clarify our policies and provide direction as to how a challenge should be handled. Regardless of the merits of a challenge, members of the school community have a right to bring forth a request to review curriculum materials in a manner that is safe and respectful. Opening the challenge to an immediate public hearing outside of any other context or discussion is a prescription for creating misunderstanding and anxiety. In order to create a reasoned and thoughtful process for any review, I move that the Arlington School Committee suspend file IJ-R until May 25th and directs the Policies and Procedures Subcommittee to present to the full school committee any recommendations for amending file IJ, IJR, and KEC. Do I hear a second? Is there further discussion about this? 
Mr. Cardin. So I'm not seeing the reference to another policy in the version that's in Novus. There are there are other policies linked to that initial policy. That's what what I'm referencing. I think the reference is in IJ. Mm -hmm. In IJ. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's at the bottom. And there's mention in IJR that you you would go to other policies, which we're not really coming to. District adopted procedure, as mm -hmm. it says. Which would be sort of uh, the R dash uh, addition to a policy manual. Other discussion? Mm -hmm. Question. Yes, so wait, mm -hmm. I'm trying to. So does does KEC exist or no? No. I oh, I don't want KEC. No. 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 It, was, no. it does not. It was. Um, it, it did exist. It did right. exist. My end it doesn't exist anymore. It does not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Got it. There. When you in 2019, there was a big mm -hmm. revamp of the policies, mm -hmm. yeah. and it looks mm -hmm. like that was KEC mm -hmm. um, was eliminated. Referring it back to KE, and the subcommittee could make recommendations under KE as well. But uh, because KEC is specifically referenced in the policy book under IJ, we need to affirm that we don't want that policy there and remove the reference. Mr. Thielman. So, um, one, two questions. Do we have to move to suspend the rules first to re uh, re uh, suspend this policy with just one reading? Essentially, we're doing this. So I would think we, a two-thirds vote, I, I'm viewing it as a two-thirds vote would be required either way. So, <clears throat> okay. So my, my so I, I think it's necessary to go look at this policy for sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think the Policies and Procedures Committee needs to meet and uh, talk about this. The value of suspending the policy is so we don't uh, have any, so what, what's the value? So we don't have any uh, challenges between now and the 25th of May. It's so we, so that we can revise the policy and set up the framework. Okay. Because what we have now is broken and we don't want to introduce anything into a broken system. Mr. Chair, let me Oh, I'm from. sorry. Yeah. Um, it's to be transparent with the public about what our intentions are, yeah. that we are not accepting uh, challenges under this policy at this time. We're making it clear when we will finish our discussion and then we will see where we're at at that point. Um, and okay. uh, I did, uh, I want to mention that I did speak with town council and he felt that this, there is no legal impediment for yeah. us to suspend this. This is not a legally required policy or a legally required concept. Unlike, if you think, of, if you remember the budget hearing, yeah. that's legally required. We have to do it in a certain way. This policy is here because we want it on some level. Now, in terms of wanting it, we have the policy the MASC gave us that many other communities use, so it's not like we made this up from whole cloth. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we've now found that in our town, we would benefit from a perhaps more nuanced mm -hmm. approach, and we need to figure out what that is. Mm -hmm. Ms. Exton. So I'm looking at file IJ, mm -hmm. and I'm not seeing where that, where does where that comes into one questioning or challenging the curriculum. It's just, um, it, it's, it's just, uh, I, I, it's just KEC. I, IJ-R is a I subsidiary. See, I see, you're saying KEC is, is cross-referenced at IJ. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. In, in, in IJ. IJ-R is a parent, is, is, under, a, is, yes, a, is, sub. A, is yep. a child of IJ. Yep. Mm -hmm. And KEC doesn't exist, so that mm -hmm. cross-reference mm -hmm. shouldn't right. even be there. So, mm -hmm. Okay. You know, they should work together, and yeah. instead they're like, they're like, okay. Mm -hmm. Ms. Morgan. Does, it, does, but we're only suspending IJR, not mm -hmm. IJ. Right. Okay. 
Because mm -hmm. so I just I don't want to do anything that runs us afoul of the the um, literacy path, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like because we kind of mm -hmm. yeah, need to do. Point. I don't know where that's coming, but I know yeah. it's coming like a freight it. train. It, a good, a really. That's mm -hmm. a very good point. Mm -hmm. Freight train. Shiny. Shiny. Yeah. Freight train. <laughs> Any, Mr. Hardy. So, but, but so what I'm saying is, is that we're only talking about IJR. Suspending IJR. Okay. Mm -hmm. But potentially, one might expect an uh, an edit to IJ that removes the cross reference. Potentially. Oh, well, yeah, I would, yeah, I would say that would definitely be in order, and we may go beyond that just to tighten the circle. Thank you, Mr. Cardin. Uh, thank you. So. I, I am able to pull up the old KEC and KECR, and neither of them required a hearing. So that, mm -hmm. um, so it's not like our current policies require us to have a hearing. Our current policies require the district to review the complaint using procedures, mm -hmm. which we went back to what we did last time, which made sense. But I don't know, but we don't have to, if a new complaint comes in tomorrow, mm -hmm. we don't have to schedule a hearing. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to support suspending the policy. Um, I, I think it has a, not a great look to suddenly suspend a policy. So I don't, I don't encourage anybody to schedule a hearing if we get another complaint, um, but I also don't think we need to suspend the policy to do that. Okay. Any further discussion? Okay. I think no matter what, <clears throat> I'm leaning where Mr. Cardin is. I, I, I think no matter what we do, the, the motion I would like to see at some point is the policies and procedures subcommittee is directed to look at policy IJR and other related policies and report back of the school committee within 30 days on its recommendations. <clears throat> but there's another motion on the table. It was seconded. I'm not making a substitute motion or any other motion. I'm just mm -hmm. telling you what my, where my, where my mm -hmm. thinking is at. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry if I didn't make it clear. Mm -hmm. earlier. Is my concern <clears throat> with not suspending it is that it says right now um, the disposition of the problem will be made in a reasonable period of time using district adopted procedures, which we don't really have. So if a challenge comes in, if we don't suspend it, a challenge comes in tomorrow, the, I, the policy subcommittee does their work and comes back with a, a differently district adopted procedure. I don't know, that's, I'm mulling over in my head how how a challenge made tomorrow, if it is still in existence, is it was made under the old policy, I guess, is my concern. Okay. So, Ms. Morgan. Um, so basically, if a if if we didn't suspend this, mm -hmm. right, I would I would argue that 30 days is still a reasonable amount of time yeah. to dispose <clears throat> of a challenge, right? But the concern is that there's like, when you make it, that starts, like that, that you're making it, I mean, the way that it's written right now is so vague mm -hmm. that like, it, I mean, it could kind of be anything, mm -hmm. right? On some level. Um, so I guess, I guess the, the crux of the question is what would, if the policy wasn't suspended, mm -hmm. what would we do if a challenge came in tomorrow? It's a, it's a good question because the one thing you might encounter is somebody saying, well, you set up a hearing for this last time. Why aren't you doing it again? And by suspending the policy, you're, you're, you're taking the expectation that we're going to have a hearing in, in May uh, because we scheduled a hearing for this complaint in April. Um. To, me, to me, it's just an acknowledgement that where we are, we don't want to do what we did again, and we want to change it, and any complaint that comes in will be under a different set of guidelines. There's no 30 day. Yeah. Okay. Uh, my motion was tw until May 25th. Yeah, but there's no 30 day requirement in the policy. Okay. Yeah. Dr. Holman. So from my sort of position in this um, 
discussion, one of the things I'm thinking about is our, our ability to focus on our core charge, which is the education of the students. And the, we, you know, we put significant resources and time into thinking about what a district adopted procedure would look like when we received this challenge. And then a lot of um, time has been expended over the past week, making sure that we were prepared for the hearing, organized for it, um, and that was at the expense of some other things that are very, it's a very busy time of year. And so if we were to get another, the thing I'm thinking about as you all discuss this is that the benefit to the school system of potentially suspending this policy could be that if we were to get uh, another challenge tomorrow, that it would provide us with the time to think about what a procedure, an appropriate procedure would look like um, in order to address that challenge within policy that might be shifting at the same time um, without needing to think about both procedurally how to address the challenge and the challenge itself um, within a reasonable period of time, whatever we deem that might be, which is also vague. So I put that on the table just from my vantage point as a superintendent. But, but if we suspend the policy, mm -hmm. we can't have a challenge. There's no mechanism for anybody mm -hmm. to put forward a challenge, mm -hmm. right? So there won't be one mm -hmm. tomorrow if or a month. The if it's suspended, yes. right? Because by suspending it, I think that's the piece that's tricky, right? Mm -hmm. And that's, mm -hmm. I think, what Mr. Cardin is saying. Well, I don't know what he's saying, but I mean, like, <laughs> the, by suspending the policy, we are also suspending the ability to challenge mm -hmm. for. 30, I don't know, you know, till the 25th. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I would say what this does do is it gives us a pause to <clears throat> think about our recent experience, mm -hmm. think about what our goals are for challenges, for community discussions, and together with the superintendent, craft a procedure that reflects best practice and is able to contain emo contain issues which may have significant emotion or uh, conflict in them. And I feel right now we don't have that ability. You know, if there's a challenge tomorrow, I don't see how we would be able to shift in midstream and react in a more thoughtful manner. Mm -hmm. And I think we need, I would prefer that we take a pause and give ourselves the chance to um, think about that and to come up with a better procedure. Uh, I'm going to support suspending the policy because I think that uh, this opens up um, room for confusion, for feeling um, grandfathered into the current policy mm -hmm. while we make changes to improve the, the process. Um, and so I think this is the right, the right choice to do better going forward is to suspend mm -hmm. this policy for till May 25th. Any further comment? Okay. Um, all those in favor of suspending policy IJR, say aye. 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 Okay. Um, all those opposed? No. No. Okay. Um, and any abstentions? So, for the minutes, can we do a roll call? Um, a little late. Well, the, the, <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> we'll do a roll call. Um, Ms. Gittleson? Yes. Mr. Carton? Nope. Ms. Morgan? Yes. Mr. Fieldman? No. Ms. Eggleston? Yes. Mr. Schleckman? Yes. And I also vote yes. So that passes five to two with no abstentions. The policy IJR is suspended 
until May 25th. Uh, parents, especially regarding the um, human growth and development curriculum, still have recourse. Mm -hmm. If they have concerns, they can abstain or what, what I'll talk it? about it in my update too. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So I'll let you <coughs> deal with the mm -hmm. mechanics of that. Please reach out to us if you have comments or concerns. Yes. Um, okay. Mr. Can I move that we refer the policy to the Policy and the Procedures Committee? That was in the motion. Oh, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. I would also ask that you look at BEE. Okay. We'll go anywhere, you know. Um, Okay, mm -hmm. next, approval of job descriptions. Okay, you have two job descriptions. I wanna thank, first of all, the CIA subcommittee for meeting on Monday. Um, I was not able to attend, but uh, we received notes on three job descriptions that were discussed at CIAA. Um, two of those are currently in your materials. I've pulled the third, and I'll talk about that in just a second. Um, the two that are in your materials, I do want to note an adjustment of uh, to ensure that it's in accordance with the budget of the, uh, the uh, technical theater manager job description. The um, salary range was uh, slightly adjusted. We had budgeted $85,000 for that role, so the salary range is seventy to $100,000 for that role. We know that the, the, the reason for that adjustment, and it was kind of last minute, um, also is, and the reason for that large range is because there's a large level of technical skill that somebody may bring or not. So it's gonna be commensurate, the negotiation of that salary will be commensurate with the experience that they're bringing into the role. Um, and then there's also a communication specialist job description for your review. And we made a couple of small revisions to um, that one, specifically the revision around the master's degree being a preferred degree for this role. Uh, again, the uh, negotiation of that salary would be in accordance with experience that they're bringing into the position. Um, and I want to note that while this is drafted without FTEs attached to it, it will be posted as a point six, or it'd be um, filled as a point six position for next year uh, because of some restructuring that's happening at central office. So um, uh, the other job description that was discussed at CIAA was for a, a school transition and family liaison position at the Gibbs. Uh, this is the start of what I'm hoping will be some family liaison types of roles at our schools to help a uh, bridge between family and community, provide additional resources to families, um, provide uh, access to outside events, um, translations, interpretation, etc. cetera, at the, at the direction of the principals. So it's a pilot, it's part of the ESSER grant. It's not in your materials because I was working with at the request of the CIA subcommittee, which was good guidance, um, our legal counsel, our bargaining units, and I got some questions that I just wanna slow down on. Um, so I wanna go back and take a look at that one again, think about salary ranges, think about um, unit positions. We've talked about making those unit C positions. We've talked about um, lots of different possibilities. What's tricky about some of our unit positions is that we're hoping this will be an evening and a summer long um, role and that they will be able to do things like take on, for example, science camp uh, and the coordination of that, which would require some hours outside of what some of our bargaining units allow. So I just wanna have more conversations with folks internally about that one before I bring it back to you all, which is why I got pulled for now. It's probably coming back at some point. So those are the two before you for today. Move adoption. Second. Just a question. Um, so maybe for Mr. Spiegel, I'm not sure. Um, since this is not a, a union position, if, if we decide to hire a candidate who does not have the minimum qualifications, are we allowed to do that? Who does, who does not have Which one? Not, which one? The three years. W which, which job? Which job? Oh, with the, the theater manager. Ah. Um, I think if the other experience outweighs I mean, I think if we, I don't know, if, uh, just I had it up in a second ago. I think if the other experience outweighed um, the minimum qualifications, um, we could consider it. Okay. Um, I think, um, Any more questions? No. Okay. Um, 
All those voting in favor of the two positions, approving the two positions? Yes. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? That's a unanimous vote. Yep. Next is Dr. Homan with the superintendent's report. I don't have any pretty pictures for you this week, I'm sorry, but I do have some good news. Um, so I want to say congratulations to four Audison Middle School National History Day projects uh, by students that have advanced to the national competition in June at the University of Maryland. That's very exciting. The titles of these brilliant projects are on the screen. Um, everything from the rights of students with disabilities to the Ch Chinese Transcontinental Railroad to the Manhattan Project to contraceptives and how they've changed the lives of women. So brilliant projects, really so proud of our students who, uh, who created these projects and have made it to the national competition and we wish them luck. Um, speaking of social studies, I also wanna congratulate um, Gibbs teacher Shana Byrne. She was chosen by the Massachusetts Council for Social Studies to receive the William Spratt Award for Excellence in Teaching Middle School Social Studies recently, and they surprised her with that announcement, I think on Monday morning, um, over at the Gibbs. So congratulations to Shana, that's very well deserved. I have some updates on administrative hiring searches, our bishop principal search, we are currently in the process of final reference checking of finalists, and the announcement is forthcoming probably tomorrow. Uh, also, for bracket principal, we did the initial round of interviews this week. Um, we're trying some new interview approaches over uh, at our at bracket and at Bishop, uh, where the candidates go through three small groups. They spend an hour and a half with us, sort of as a collective. We get a lot more time with the candidates, um, and they spend time with smaller groups so that they can build connections with the groups, get to know the community a little bit, um, have some sort of slowed down conversations so that we can get to know the candidates a little bit better. The feedback on this process has been uh, resoundingly positive, particularly from Brackett where we made a couple of small tweaks. Uh, the candidate, the committees also undergo some bias and hiring training. They do this initial screening for the candidates and they had a lengthy conversation in debrief. So we have three finalists um, potentially for Brackett principal and I am hopeful that we'll be announcing who those finalists are tomorrow. For Director of Community or Communications and Family Engagement, we will have our initial interviews after break and we're in the process of putting together an interview committee for that role. And for Director of Research Data and Accountability, initial interviews will be the first week of May and Dr. McNeil is leading that search. I have a few updates on the human growth and development curriculum and the challenge. As everybody knows and as we were discussing, that challenge was withdrawn. Um, as such, the curriculum as is will stay in place for now. Um, that's not a problem at all, and I wanna say it stays in place and we're not considering any changes <coughs> for it at the moment. Um, this year's curriculum has already been implemented, so it's not, that, that doesn't have any impact really on what's happening right now. Uh, redacted feedback will be shared with the administration and staff. It might be summarized um, or quoted directly. Um, also with the school committee. Families are always welcome to reach out to us with feedback, comments, uh, concerns that they have about curriculum uh, or their child experience at any time. And so I hope folks won't hesitate to reach out to myself, to Dr. McNeil, to Ms. Visco, if they have continuing questions about the human growth and development curriculum. And our next steps will be based on the feedback gathered and determined and messaged in the coming months and as we have ongoing conversations about policy as well and in collaboration with the community, the school committee, and our health and wellness department. I have uh, just briefly, yeah, and the parents can, um, if parents want to uh, have their children not. Oh yes, well, uh, as part of the regulation, of course, parents are, well, I mean, again, they've been implemented for this year, but as part of the regulation for this curriculum specifically, parents are able to pull their student out um, and not participate in the curriculum if they so choose and they reach out to their principal in order to do that. Um, is that it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, for uh, the, we were going to have our lab executive director, um, Pam Gerard, join us for today's meeting um, because we weren't certain about the sort of timing of today's meeting. Uh, we've asked her to instead join for a budget subcommittee meeting on the 24th where we'll be discussing the um, lab collaborative agreement that came to you all and the addition of Watertown to the lab collaborative that also came to all of you. The only other update I have on this, besides that we're planning the meet and budget subcommittee on Monday the 24th uh, and hear a little bit more about the agreement and discuss it, uh, is that the other four communities um, have, are, have, you have signed on to uh, the agreement so far. 
So there, at the moment, um, Arlington is the only one who has not, and, your, and the enrollments are included in your um, materials. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Um, next, we have the consent agenda. All, is, all items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests, in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Warrant number 23231 from April 4th, 2023, $1,082,086.67. So moved. <laughs> Second. <laughs> okay. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? No. So that passes unanimously. Subcommittee and liaison reports. Budget. That's not right. Uh, <laughs> 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 okay. Budget. Mr. Cardin, now I have to remember who the I signed chair, what. Yes, as of two minutes ago, <laughs> half an hour ago. Uh, so yes, so um, we are meeting on the 24th at 11, um, probably in hybrid format, uh, to hear about the lab uh, finances in addition to Watertown, and to the extent we can, um, to also talk about the cost of the strategic plan. Mm -hmm. um, just to make sure everybody is aware, we, you know, we've been working on the Long Range Planning Committee to insert the costs of the strategic plan into the next override plan. So um, an initial cost out came to um, $6.7 million over five years. Um, if anybody cares about the numbers, it's $1 million in the first year in FY24, $3.1 million in FY25, $1.7 million in FY26, $600,000 in FY27, and down to $300,000 in FY28. Um, the FY24 number would, would replace the 600,000 one-time COVID aid that we're getting, and in FY25, the 3.1 million would also replace the 300,000 in COVID aid that currently is in the plan. Um, the other change uh, that we agreed to at Long Range Planning is starting in FY25 to reduce the special education inflation number to 6.5% based on our recent history. So all of that sort of went into Sandy's special calculator, and he came up with um, a number of $7 million needed for an override if we do it in FY24. In FY24. Uh, so there was talk uh, about long, at Long Range Plan about doing that. Um, things moved a little bit too fast for everybody, both for us because we weren't quite ready with the details of what that $6.7 million uh, pays for. Uh, more than half of it is actually for um, uh, compar uh, comparable salaries. So um, we needed more time, they needed more time. So the select board discussed it at their last two meetings. They're meeting every week now because of a uh, town meeting. They discussed it at their last two meetings. At their meeting on Monday, it was um, agreed, they didn't take any votes, but it was agreed that um, we would wait till October to do an override vote, but the select board would take their vote to put on the ballot in June so that everybody would know before they left for the summer that this is happening in October. Uh, we were also at Finance Committee last night, Kiersey and I were, um, where they heard from Sandy about these numbers um, and there's a plan for us to go back before the FinCom votes on the override plan in end of May or early June to present more information about our strategic plan to them. That's the plan. Anything you want to add? Yeah. Um, the one, um, I think the select board is going to vote the date of the override in June, and then they will vote the number in August, September. I'm not totally sure when. Okay. So, okay. Yeah, I just want to, on the process, so the FinCom is going to meet after the date is selected, but before the number is voted on by the select board. Is that what you're saying? I didn't know the number wasn't being going to be included in the select board vote. I don't know that the FinCom knows that either, so I don't know what their I, their plan I, was. As of last night, their plan was to do what they did last time. Right. The select board voted both the number and the date, yeah. and then the FinCom <clears throat> voted. That's, that was their plan, so if, they're not, if there isn't a number, I don't know how that affects their plan. Yeah. I'd be interested I, in seeing. Yeah. Well, yeah. I think our presentation is just to give them information, because right now the only people 
um, on FinCom who have heard about the strategic plan or our asks are the ones who are on long range plan. And the rest of them are like, well, what are you asking? You know, what is this money for? And so that's, we agreed to go in and give them a presentation. And uh, I worked with the chair of the finance committee <coughs> and we agreed to either late May or early June. It kind of depends on what's happening with town meeting. Um, and I don't know that they were gonna, they're not gonna take a vote, at least my understanding was not that they were going to take a vote on our plan. This was just an informational session. Right, but they were they were discussing last night meeting in June after the select board beats to vote on the override plan. Yeah, usually override right on the plan. Okay. So okay. Um, yeah. if there's no number, <laughs> and then it's gonna make it harder for them to do that. They might not do it without a number. They might wait. Yes. Yeah, they might wait. Yeah. That'd be my guess. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any more comments about that? No. Okay. Uh, community relations. Who's next? Thank you. Um, so we have three more chats scheduled for the rest of this um, academic year: April 29th, May 20th, and June 10th. And I don't believe there is anyone signed up yet. So be on the lookout for an email for me asking you to participate. Curriculum instruction account assessment and accountability, Ms. Morgan. Uh, we met on Monday to go over some job descriptions and we do not have another meeting scheduled, but I'm sure that we will have the opportunity to do that sometime soon. Facilities, Mr. Thielman. Uh, no report on facilities, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> facilities are no report. Okay. Policy, Mr. Schulte. I guess we're going to have a meeting uh, within the next couple of weeks. Okay. High School Building Committee? No reports since I gave you an update last week. That's enough. Okay. Superintendent evaluation? Yeah, I think we, it expired with the new... Uh, yeah, that, that's <laughs> yeah. what... I think we're, we'll, we'll take we can that just out. get rid of that one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, any liaison reports? I do. I have a liaison report and an announcement. Oh, oh wow. Okay, um, can I do them all at once? Is that all right? Okay, uh, the wellness committee, gosh, we continue to meet, uh, continue to hammer away at that wellness policy. We're getting close, so Mr. Schlickman, it'll be coming your way. It is, it's, it's been heavily, heavily edited, so that's exciting. Um, I did it three. Oh, Mr. Mason and I went um, yesterday and had an opportunity to meet with uh, Cindy Friedman and talk about universal uh, school lunches, which was great, was very well received, um, and I'm glad uh, he did a great job, and I'm glad that we were part of a very, um, it was a great group. Um, and then my announcement, I sent um, Dr. Homan, a photo. Can you? It is not in the. It's not in the email. No. Oh no! What? There. I was oh. confused. Oh dear. All right. Hold on. I'm going to send it right now. Um. So. All right. Hold on. This is worth waiting for, you guys. <laughs> it is. No. I'm, I'm ready. It's. It's going to be. Well, I know you have to be able to see it. Maybe my. All right. Okay. It's coming now. So I'll work on my announcement part of this while you work on pulling up the photo that I just sent you. So um, I heard from a community member, and we've all seen this as we're coming in. Um, so students in our makerspace woodworking classes with uh, teacher Nate uh, Muleisen have been doing service projects around the school to contribute um, and to learn about design thinking. And they've reached out to the school staff for requests so they're meeting needs that we have, um, especially in our um, in our 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 more temporary spaces where we're not in a position to invest, our students are, are coming in and are making things that we need. Um, so the first projects include the benches in the connector, uh, which were done by Jake Davies, and I come in and out of this building and there are always kids mm -hmm. sitting mm -hmm. on those benches. Um, I think they're lovely. Um, mm -hmm. And they also built portable stairs in the auditorium, um, and that was done by Ryan Hurricane. 
Arlington. Uh, they've made bins for food storage for Arlington Eats, which were done by a whole bunch of kids. And they're all sort of busy working away on projects for identified needs in the school. And the shop is just churning things out, which is, is very cool. So thank you to, um, to uh, Mr. Muleisen. Uh, thank you to Dr. Jenger for getting me some info on this. Um, and big thanks to the students who um, are making this happen. Thank you. Um, any more liaison or liaison report, Mr. Oh, announcement. Announcement. OK. Um, Mass Association of School Committees will once again hold its annual Day on the Hill Legislative Advocacy event on May 4th. The, mor mor <clears throat> the morning program begins at 9 a.m. at the UMass Club in Boston. Uh, we're invited to join members for coffee and pastry at 9 a.m. before the program and join for a lunch at the State House at 12 which is a magnificent lunch because it is catered by uh, the culinary programs in various uh, vocational technical high schools. Um, traditionally, uh, student reps have been more than welcome. Uh, yes, yes, field trip, uh, field trip. Um, and uh, I think in the past, I don't know, it doesn't say so here, but in the past we've been able to bring student reps without charge. But it, it's definitely a good day to, to learn things about the legislature. There's interaction with some of the legislative leaders that deal with education. And probably the best food of any meeting you'll do this year. Is it the first one in, like, years? First one since pre-pandemic. They've been online, yeah. 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 <clears throat> Oh. Highly recommended. The folks from Lexington always go, so if you want to meet your neighbors, you'll probably find them here. Okay. Any other announcements? Future agenda items. Anything? No? Okay. Uh, motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Okay. Motion to adjourn, made by Mr. Thilman, second by Ms. Exton. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? 90-minute meeting, Madam Chair. Pretty good. Bye. Bye.